I want to wrap up talking about the uh, preliminary stage and negotiation and one of the reasons that we take a little longer in going through the stages in uh, negotiations is that you're going to find the stages are basically replicated when we start talking about mediation. So there's definitely an overlapping process involved. So we've talked about the first two steps in, in a fair amount of detail. Preparation, of course, involves uh, the work that you do with your client to establish uh, rapport between the two of you and um, most importantly understanding exactly what the case is about and being able to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses based upon information that you glean from a client that's forthcoming with information both good and bad and remember you're not going to be able to get bad or negative information if the client's not comfortable with you. So this is a process that is extremely important in order for you to, at the front end, uh, have the best possible opportunity to understand the, the strengths and weaknesses of your case and deal with them in the most positive way that you can in order to get the most effective outcome for your case. So that's preparation. We talked a lot uh, about the preliminary stage, which is basically uh, what's going to happen in terms of setting the stage or the tone for the negotiations or the mediation between you and your opponent. And one of the things that we really spent a lot of time talking about was the need to try to find similarities and things that you have common interests in, in order to help pave the way for perhaps a better and smoother uh, process. So we also talked about some environmental factors that you, I, we really can't undervalue. So while it's crucial to uh, make sure that you find as much common ground as you can with your opponent, it's also very important to make sure that everybody is comfortable with the environment that is going to make people feel more at ease, uh, less intimidated. So we talked about moving away from, uh, you know, a location where one side or the other feels that there's an uneven playing field. So we're not going to go to a courthouse or one of the attorney's offices, but hopefully a location that's neutral and everybody feels comfortable uh, and, and, you know, maybe has some, some food and some refreshments to make the process again easier to deal with and more palatable to all parties uh, because that's going to make again a more effective outcome for both sides. So one of the things or questions that, that rises in terms of negotiations is uh, cultural differences whether it's uh, are there differences in terms of negotiation whether you're a male or female, or whether you're black or white or Asian or whatever. And there have been studies, and quite frankly, the studies have shown that there are, uh, at the end of the day, no differences uh, that are statistically significant uh, among uh, cultures, uh, you know, whether it's race, gender. There is uh, a study that uh, has found that women tend to underestimate their uh, level of preparation when engaging in negotiations and in fact uh, have a much more difficult time negotiating when it's on their own behalf. So in other words, women that are negotiating for a job, negotiating for a pay increase, negotiating for something that benefits the, the uh, female there seems to be uh, an issue where they, they do not uh, negotiate at as high a level as, uh, say, males would in the same circumstances. Otherwise, for clients, uh, there, there are no uh, significant or statistical differences whatsoever. So that's kind of interesting there if, if that's something that you had thought about. Uh, what about negotiating styles? Well, that's something that we talked a little bit about that you're going to want to hopefully have an understanding about before you meet 
your opponent at a negotiation. It's, it's very helpful to understand the style of negotiation or just in general how someone litigates a case and their uh, you know, overall the concepts of it. So you've got a couple different scenarios. You've got, uh, if you've heard of the book or read the book, Getting to Yes, which has been around forever, uh, it's kind of a primer on negotiation. But that talks a great deal about the uh, cooperative problem-solving approach to negotiation. And that style of negotiating tends to, again, based on studies, usually arrive at the highest or best outcome uh, for, for each side. Um, as opposed to competitive or adversarial negotiators. So when you have an opponent that is taking the adversarial or competitive approach, you have someone that's really thinking more about a side or an individual rather than looking at the cooperative problem-solving concept of, of considering the interests of the parties and how those interests can actually become intersecting interests and ways that because uh, when you think about pretty much any dispute, you basically have a pie. Not that this is a very good replication of a pie, but that's what you have. And like all pies, you can only slice it so many different ways and so many times. So with the adversarial competitive uh, opponents, you have someone that is going to try to take the most of the pie as they possibly can. So rather than splitting the pie, you're going to have someone that's going to try to maybe get this much of the pie. Uh, and if they can, they're going to try to get the whole pie. I mean, that's their, their basic concept. Now, with the Cooperative problem solving people, you're going to find individuals that are looking to take this pie and before it's sliced, maybe arrive or think outside the box and try to figure out ways that the pie can be divided in ways that actually address the interests of the parties and maybe can provide more than someone originally anticipated because of the way the pie is divided and more creative problem-solving approach. So, competitive adversarial, going to gobble up as much of that pie as possible. Problem solvers are going to try to figure out ways to make as much of the pie work for the parties as possible. Uh, and it, it, it does tend to make much better and more uh, salient uh, outcomes uh, at the end of the day when you have people that are problem solving. Uh, that you sometimes have people that have blended styles uh, and you know at the end of the day I think everyone recognizes the need to zealously advocate for their client. Uh, however, you know we also talked about avoiding or being cognizant of the zealot and the serious problems that can arise when you have that type of individual. So uh, those are the basic types of negotiating styles that you're going to encounter and that you may have already encountered in classes or in uh, just in life in general. So, uh, all right. Now we're going to move into the third stage of the process, which is the informational stage. And I think it's probably pretty obvious what we're talking about is the point in time where we're going to start to share information about our case and try to obtain information from the other side about their case. And this is where one of the critical things that, that you as, as a counselor want to determine 
are the other side's essentials, what's important, and what's desirous for them. Because when you have that information, it's going to make your ability to negotiate much easier uh, if you can determine ways, again, that understanding your opponent's needs, what's essential to them, what's important and desirous, you can then look at that pie in a little bit of a different way to figure out maybe creative ways to give them what is essential and even maybe what's important uh, but still retaining as much of the pie as you can. Uh, and when you understand early on what those needs are, it's amazing what you can accomplish through the rest of the negotiation. So uh, this is, if you remember when we talked a little bit about the tool that we all carry in our belt or our toolbox, that is the scariest tool it's scarier than a chainsaw. It's, I mean, it's the scariest thing that, that lawyers deal with, law students, lawyers, anybody. And it's the thing that can help get you the most information in the most expedient and efficient way possible early on in a negotiation. And what is that tool? Silence. Now, not just silence. There's something that has to precede the silence in order to be effective. And uh, one of the things that people love to do, generally, always, and in negotiations you have parties that have this interest overriding everything else, and that is they have a story to tell. They want, they, they have a dispute, they're angry, they're emotional, they have a, a, some matter in their life that precipitates this entire claim, dispute, litigation that they want to get out on the table and let everybody, let the world know. So that is an opportune time to begin the negotiation by asking open-ended questions and then stop, listen, be silent, let the other side take the reins and start running and just listen actively. And remember when we talked about active listening, it's more than simply just listening. I mean, there's, there is actually a method to actively listening, and part of the method is being able to, to convey back what it is that you're hearing, but primarily being silent. Uh, you don't have to give a, a paragraphs when you convey back what, what you're hearing, but preliminarily, when you start with your informational exchange, Begin with open-ended, broad questions and let the other side just dump. That's going to provide you with more information than you can possibly imagine. But so often, both sides want to dive in and just start you know, telling their story, uh, telling their side, making you... Uh, or making the other side understand why the dispute is so important or trying to make the other side understand why there's no validity to the dispute depending on what side you're on, right? Because generally you have a client that you're trying to impress. But this is where preparation with the client and expectations are so critical so that you explain to the client, look, I understand that we have a story to tell and, and that you have very significant feelings about the underlying situation, whatever that may be. But in order to arrive at the best possible outcome for our case, we are going to engage in some methodology early on in the negotiations where we let the other side tell us what they know, what they have, what they want, what they think, 
Because knowledge is power. And the more that we listen, actively obtain that information, the more and the better we can handle our case, whether we're on the plaintiff side or the defense side, whatever side we're on, by getting more information, which generally is free-flowing. I mean, it's amazing when you're quiet how compelled people are to tell you more. It's rare that you'll find someone that just stops. And that's the problem lawyers run into frequently in trials when they're cross-examining somebody and they get an answer that's just exactly what they want and then they have to go back for just one more question. And that's when they start getting in trouble. So we don't want to do that. We want to get as much information as we possibly can. So. Uh, we keep the questions broad and open and when we hear a question that we either maybe or we hear information that we don't necessarily understand or we have a question about part of the active listening process is as part of our conveying back our understanding of what's being said ask the follow-up questions it's amazing especially in depositions when you'll hear, you know, someone ask a question about, uh, you know, if, if someone has a, a prior, uh, any issues with drug use, and they'll say something like, well, not now, or not, not really. And then you'll have someone with 50 questions, and they just go on to the next question like nothing was ever said. Well, you know if you're actually actively listening and someone says, well, not really, or not now, or not anymore, I mean, that just naturally leads to the follow-up question of, oh, well, tell me more about past issues with that. I mean, it's just a natural follow-up question that if you were having a conversation with someone at Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's, would be immediate. I mean, you would want to know more. It, it would just be a, a normal conversational reality. But when you're locked into notes or locked into something that you can't break free from, you're not going to be able to hear what's being said that might be really important for your case. So that's, again, uh, following up with questions that when you start with open-ended questions are just as important. Now, the other question, uh, then becomes about when you're providing information, what information are you willing to provide and basically willing to disclose? And then there's questions obviously about whether something may be privileged uh, or information that might be problematic for you that you don't want to give up for whatever reason or that you might want to wait to share until later on in the process if, if there's a strategic reason that you might want to do that. Uh, but so you might think about that in advance, about information that you want to be careful not to divulge. And you may have an opponent that actually took this class as well and asks you an open-ended question. What you have to resist is the temptation to do what all lawyers love to do, and that is to talk. So I think most people can handle the concept of silence, but at some point you're going to be called upon to start to speak, right? Because if you start a negotiation and all you're doing is you know, writing down information the other side is giving to you, at some point, they're going to stop communicating if you're not providing anything from your end. So you need to think about the things that you want to be careful about divulging or simply not divulging. And you need to have kind of a little list running so that you don't do that. And you have to be cognizant of the things that you say in response to open-ended questions or else you can run into the same problem that you're hoping your opponent has and that is vomiting at the mouth and you really want to be careful that you don't do that you want to have you know we started off the class talking about intentional negotiating 
intentionality and what that means. And everything that you do, we talk, we're talking about these checklists. We're talking about going through a very quasi-rigid process, but there's a reason for that. The reason is, is that it will help keep you in check from making mistakes that we can benefit from our opponent making. I mean, we want them to do that, but you don't want to fall into the same trap. So one of the things that uh, you want to think about are uh, being aware of, of blocking techniques that your opponent may use to prevent uh, you from getting information. Uh, common techniques are essentially obfuscation. So you ask, ask someone about uh, a prior drug use and they start talking about uh, civic functions that the client uh, is uh, routinely engaged in. Well, that, that, that didn't even address the question that was asked at all. It was actually obfuscation, right? So when we obfuscate, we're basically turning something to something else to move away from something that's being talked about that we don't want to talk about for our client that might be negative. Um, so one of the things to think about when you have a, an opponent that's using a blocking technique like obfuscation or other techniques are answering a question with a question. That's pretty common as well. When you see that happening, one of the things that I think helps to bring you back and not forget it is so easy when you're under the stress of trying to keep a lot of things circulating in your head you're trying to think about your BATNA, your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. You're trying to think about keeping your client in check. You're trying to think about asking the right open-ended questions. But when you encounter someone that is, you know, skilled at blocking, take a note of what you ask that's being blocked or obfuscated or uh, that someone's trying to divert and make a big star or asterisk by that so that you don't forget to go back to it and then go back to it. I mean, if, they, if your opponent wants to take you down a road that is going east and you were going north, I mean, you can take a little excursion to the east, but what you need to remember is, hey, you know, we're gonna come back and now we're gonna go back north and I'm gonna ask you again. So just ask them about the, the question that you had originally. At some point, you know, they may forget that they need to obfuscate and answer the question. Or you can uh, go down the road they're taking you and then wait and then maybe, you know, 20, 30 minutes later, go back to that question that you had a star by and see if you can work that in and maybe they'll be less likely to think about blocking it because they've already blocked it once. So. There are ways to deal with that. You just have to be aware that it's happening. Um, and of course, it's blocking techniques or things that you can utilize when you are being asked questions that you don't necessarily want to answer. And uh, those are, are pretty good techniques, actually, if, if you're skilled at using them. Uh, well, one of the things that we talk about uh, in the informational stage is making a principled opening offer or a demand. Um, and it leads us to the question of who, who should actually make the first offer? Uh, and I, you can find all kinds of, of differing views on this, um, but I know that so often, my opponent is not going to have a level of, of preparation involved in a case that they should. And frankly, I, I don't want to put my information out first. I, I just don't. Because if I'm aware of and cognizant of the value of things like silence and the value of getting information to flow from the other side, I'm really not going to be, you know, all that enthusiastic about sharing or making a, an opening offer. I, I want to hear what my opponent has to say. Because 
and I'm not kidding about this, but there are times when the opening offer will be your BATNA. And you'll start out, depending on the circumstances, you'll start out where you already have a better option than, than your BATNA. And that's where it starts. So it's going to end up really positive for you. But if you start out, then you've just given a huge advantage to your opponent. Now, I'm not saying that you can never do that. I'm not saying there's never a time. Sometimes there really is no alternative because your opponent may not even have enough preparation in the case to have arrived at a BATNA themselves or provided any information to their client that would help the client to understand what the value of the case is. So in that situation, you may not have any alternative if you want to move forward at all in a negotiation, but to put out the opening offer because they may simply work from that. The problem with an opening offer, regardless of who puts it out, is that it needs to be principled. And I hope you write this down, principled. What does that mean? Well, we know that we're not going to make an opening offer that is, is our BATNA, right? Because if we do that, we're obviously going to have a problem because there's really nothing to negotiate from. The problem you run into, though, is where you have uh, lawyers that will make ridiculous, idiotic offers, opening offers, that have no basis in fact, law, or anything else on earth, and it, it makes no sense. So for example, you may have a case that you value, at, your BATNA is $100,000, okay? So you go to a negotiation, you start with the process, and the opening offer from your opponent is they want $2.5 million. Now, here's the problem with something like this. And this isn't infrequent that you see this. You are going to be working closely with your client. And if you're on the plaintiff's side, the danger you run into with knowing that the case basically is going to revolve around a number like this the danger in opening with a number like that is that you are telegraphing to your client, if you're the plaintiff, how can you tell a client that his or her case is worth $100,000 and then make an opening demand of $2.5 million? I mean, there is no reality. There's no, there's no location on earth or in the universe where this makes sense. So now you have a client that, although they may not say it to you, they're wondering why you lowball them on what you value the case at. You know, then they start getting suspicious. Well, if you really think the case is worth this, why wouldn't you make an opening demand of 250,000 instead of two and a half million? Well, if you're on the other side, right, and you're on the defense side, and you're maybe an insurance adjuster, maybe this is a med mal case or a personal injury case, well, when the adjuster hears that, when anybody hears that, it's almost like saying, uh, you know, well, I, I'm, if you're going to demand two and a half million dollars, I'm going to give you a dollar to settle because it's about as ludicrous. So oftentimes when an adjuster hears some stupid, ludicrous number like this, they will just shut down. I mean, they just shut off. It's like, you know what? This attorney is an idiot. I'm not, I'm, I'm done. I, I just, I, this is, it's not good faith and there's nothing to even talk about here. So the point is, is that when you make an opening offer, and it's like everything else we've talked about in terms of front end preparation. You can't put in all of this work into your case and then screw it up 
by making an unprincipled, ridiculous, ludicrous offer or demand like this. You cannot do that. You will waste time. You will most likely eliminate the chances of success or significantly reduce the chances of a successful outcome with the negotiation because nobody's going to be thinking rationally, including your own client who's going to start thinking, why did he or she say that my case is worth 100000 and then make this opening offer of $2.5 million? And it's amazing how often this happens, and it's ridiculous. So we're going to make a principled opening. And what is that? Well, as I said before, you're obviously not going to start with your BATNA, but you need to put the time into the case on the front end before going to the negotiation where you arrive at a number that you can genuinely and legitimately say is reasonable well above or beyond what your BATNA is. Um, but it, it has to have a basis in something or else you're just going to waste time and look kind of silly. So, and the worst situation, I, I was just at uh, an, a, at a mediation, negotiation, whatever, where the uh, plaintiff has a very good case, it's a serious injury, the defense, the adjuster flew in from Nebraska to Illinois to be in the mediation. It started at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, the opening offer was a million dollars, which was policy limits, which really was not outside of the realm of, of reason. And the, the response from the defense was uh, $100,000, no, I'm sorry, $50,000. Well, a million and fifty, the disparity is so ludicrous that it basically broke down. So here we have an adjuster from an insurance carrier that traveled all the way from Nebraska to, to Southern Illinois for absolutely no reason. There was no good faith here. There was no justification. There was certainly a justification for the opening offer or the opening demand, but the response to that at $50,000 was so silly that, uh, and, and you know, just to add to this, the, the specials, the, the actual damages in the case were at least three to four hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, this was not a case where you could, in good faith, make an opening offer of fifty thousand dollars. But, nevertheless, um, that negotiation mediation fizzled out very quickly, and the other side, the defense, walked out of uh, this process after about two hours. And all I could think of was all that wasted time and energy for nothing. And now this case is just going to linger on and on and on and go nowhere fast. So what value is that to the plaintiff? And then what value is it to the defense? Because, frankly, the defense is going to risk greater exposure if the case ends up going to trial. Uh, and now they've both, well, the, really the defense side squandered the opportunity because there wasn't even an attempt to genuinely and in good faith negotiate something in this matter. So you have to have principled opening to make it work, to make sense when you start. Obviously, you also want to try to understand when you're doing your preparation what the other side's op or opening will be, but that, that sometimes you just can't. It's pretty difficult sometimes to figure that out. Um, let's see. We also uh, certainly want to have an understanding of any relevant law and how that is applicable to our case as part of 
establishing the basis for whatever position we're taking from a financial standpoint. Uh, I've got a link to a uh, high-level negotiation with George Clooney uh, that I think you'll appreciate as to why it's, it's really good to understand uh, when case law is relevant and when it is not in a negotiation. Um, I, and you may have seen it before, but I, I think it'll help you to get a pretty good understanding when you see it again. Uh, let's see. I think that pretty much wraps up the concept of the informational stage during negotiations. But again, you know, I think you, you can't put enough emphasis on the need to think about the information uh, that you want to obtain from your opponent and how you may best go about getting that. Part of that is going to be based on what you know about your opponent's negotiating style. So are they competitive adversarial? Are they cooperative problem solving type people? Um, you may not know that. Hopefully you can find that out from somebody or somehow if you don't know them and haven't worked with them before. But you also want to think about ways uh, or the information that you're prepared to provide and the information that you're not prepared to provide and how you're going to deal with that. And always keep in mind the need to keep the client in the loop as to the strategic concepts that you're utilizing. So again, you don't make an opening offer that's two and a half million dollars on a case that you've told your client is worth a hundred thousand or they're going to start to really think that something's wrong with you and uh, on the flip side you're going to have someone think that you're just basically a, a lunatic that doesn't know what you're talking about and then basically turn off the light switch and move on so when you start even if you start first uh, if you've decided there's a strategic advantage or there may be no alternative to you making the opening offer or demand, uh, that's fine. But again, you always want to think about making that principled opening that you can justify, that you can articulate a rationale for based on a combination of the facts of the case, of the future situation involved in medical issues or whatever facts you have, and any relevant legal uh, case or relevant case law, that is basically going to help you tremendously uh, because you may have an opponent that maybe really hasn't researched the case. And so now you're, you have an opportunity to instruct your opponent and the opponent's client about what this case is about and why it's problematic for their side. So whatever the circumstances, you know, you're going to have information that's valuable uh, that you're going to want to think about strategically how to best use. So uh, that's pretty much a wrap on the informational stage. And uh, we're, we're going to talk next about the, uh, we're getting towards the end here on the stages, the distributive stage of the process and, and that uh, we'll be getting close to wrapping up negotiations here.